Beginning in 1940s, and the idea of the V2, where they were Hitler's secret weapon, and that uh, we had a thing called Operation Paperclip, where after World War II, the U.S. Army uh, arrested Werner von Braun and um, you know, brought over to America not only the great rocket genius, the inventor of the, of the V2, the first man who ever was able to put a projectile in outer space. Uh, he came and lived in Fort Bliss, Texas, um, El Paso area, and started working for the Army uh, in the early Cold War period, building our missiles. So when you, you think about space, I'm not going to talk about Werner von Braun today because I did that already, but keep in mind this weird, strange backstory of Nazis coming after World War II, um, being cleared of war crimes by the federal government, uh, eventually moved to Huntsville, Alabama. Right before I came here on CNN, there's a, a commercial, Huntsville, Rocket City, USA. If you go there now, it's really the, it's the whole history of going on the moon takes place in the inventions and the protocols and the engineering of Von Braun's team at Huntsville. But in my field as a history professor, the scholarship's getting very intense that uh, why we celebrate in this summer for the 50th anniversary of going to the moon for creating the incredible Saturn V rocket that went into space and was able to deliver Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins into space and the protocol to bring them back safely, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment here. Um, there's also a kind of relooking at what did it mean for bringing this many of these uh, people that... Um, men that perhaps should have been tried at Nuremberg, uh, but we embedded them in our country because of this idea of beating the Soviets in space. We took our German scientists and the Russians took theirs. Uh, Germany got divided in half, West Germany, East Germany, and the competition between the United States and, um, and Russia has never ended. Um, in, but. I wanted to talk about Jack Kennedy in this, the, 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 today and John F. Kennedy in space and ask you guys uh, just a singular question. What would make a president of the United States who come into office, put so much, uh, all of his chips, uh, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade? Why would that be the thing that John F. Kennedy would want to make the centerpiece of a new frontier? It wasn't clear it was even possible to do anything like that by the end of the decade. Um, but the reasons that Kennedy felt compelled to it are many. Um, first off, keep in mind about um, John F. Kennedy that he was kind of an empty vessel politically. He was um, a pragmatist at heart. He never, he'd always kind of, he was more of a showboater than a workhorse. You want to go to a talk about a workhorse senator in, or congressman, read about Lyndon Johnson, who's constantly putting bills through and doing it. Jack Kennedy's dad um, bought him a private plane before anybody had him, and he'd just go flying around, including he'd come out of here to Palm Springs a lot, John F. Kennedy, Hollywood, uh, Scottsdale, Palm Beach. Cape Cod, um, a child of the rich. Um, but Kennedy, um, by not having an issue, um, was able to use space and make it his own. What I'm suggesting is, remember his father, Joe Kennedy, I have to assume all of you know about him. Well, he became ambassador to the court of St. James in World War II, but he was quite sympathetic to Hitler till very late. Uh, and so he was kind of an isolationist um, Kennedy. Um, now, young Jack Kennedy what followed in his father's footsteps, but he deviated from his father when he wrote the book Why England Slept um, as a, during World War II, and it was about Neville Chamberlain and his um, appeasement. Uh, but his, his, um, so he has that influence of his father. Jack Kennedy's also a writer, but his father, by being a kind of... Um, I don't want to overcall him a neo-fascist or something, but being fairly sympathetic to Nazi Germany till very late, um, it's, it's a, it made FDR furious. Franklin Roosevelt really does not like Joe Kennedy. And the Kennedy family, is, as you all know, they're very bonded together. Some people call them a clan. 
So the fact of the matter is that if you're um, young Jack Kennedy, you're not going around, I'm a new dealer. You know, the new dealers hate his father. So he never really, John F. Kennedy, cared that much about FDR and kind of kept him a little bit distance. Well, then you would say, well, he came out after the PT-109 hero. John F. Kennedy was the great war hero, as you know, in the Pacific, um, when he, um, the, his, his little mosquito boat in the dark of the night ran into a Japanese vessel, and his boat split in two, and two men died. Water was on fire. Kennedy put a um, you know, rope in his mouth and pulled one of his injured men to a little fly speck island in the, in the, around the Solomon Islands chain. And then they were dehydrated. And then Kennedy made a move to another fly speck island where they had coconuts. And then Kennedy carved in a coconut. He ran into two natives in the Solomon Islands who he later had visit him in the White House. But they went in a canoe and he said, help, you know, help American servicemen, you know, here carved it in the coconut. The coconut that John F. Kennedy carved his help message on sat on his desk in the Oval Office while he was president. It is at the Kennedy Library. It's John F. Kennedy's most sacred memento was this coconut that he gave, carved, and it ended up leading to the saving of his life. Kennedy became a big World War II hero. John Hershey, the great New York Times writer who wrote the book Hiroshima, and for the New Yorker, wrote the, the glowing profile of John F. Kennedy's heroism in the Pacific. So by 45, Jack Kennedy, if not a household name like Audie Murphy, was synonymous with a, the world, the young generation doing great World War II. I don't have to tell you how handsome John F. Kennedy is. I don't have to tell you he had a wit and a sense of humor. But he did not seem like somebody that was good at politics. He never did kissing babies. He never did the, um, never remembered people's names. He often didn't make eye contact when they talked to you when he ran in 46. I study presidential history. I never know a candidate except John F. Kennedy who could come in not connecting in any a populist way whatsoever with his audience, almost coming in as I'm, a, I'm an elite. But by the time he spoke, Everybody kind of swooned over him. It, it, the word charisma, as you know, is applied to him over and over again, that mysterious quality. Um, Chris Matthews of MSNBC always talks about John F. Kennedy's elusive quality. Nobody quite knew who he was, what he is, but everybody said there's something special going on. Beto O'Rourke has some of that going on for him right now. Um, and it's unusual. But Kennedy, not an, an, Truman comes in, and you would think Jack Kennedy would be at the Democrat, be part of, a, he runs for Congress, Kennedy, ninth, Truman becomes president in 45, because FDR dies April 12th, 1945, in Warm Springs, Georgia. Truman's president. Truman didn't have any big fight with Joe Kennedy, so Jack Kennedy could have been a Truman Democrat. He said, I had no use for Harry Truman. I don't see how Harry Truman can help me. He runs in 46, not, a, not basically criticizing his Democratic leader as not being tough enough on communism. Jack Kennedy's hero is Winston Churchill. In his political MO, Ted's track when Churchill comes in 1946 to Fulton, Missouri, and talks about the Iron Curtain falling across Europe, and Kennedy's, Kennedy was a hero worshiper of Winston Churchill. And he starts be defining himself as an ardent cold warrior, Jack Kennedy. Much more than on social issues, he was interested in foreign affairs. He thought Truman bungled the, the, the Korean War. He was suspicious that the, how did China become communistic in 1949 with Mao Zedong? How did the Soviets start being able to build rockets better than us when we had the best Germans building ours and, and testing them at White Sands Proving Ground? How come the Russians are beating us in missile technology? And by the time, guys, of night, they, they, the Soviets blow up a hydrogen bomb, not only do they get the A-bomb, but they get a hydrogen bomb, Kennedy's starting to define his issue as... Truman and Eisenhower are blowing it. 
And when it's Ike as president in 53, it's easy for Kennedy to have a foil because Eisenhower's of the other party. What's curious is the connection between the Kennedy family and Joe McCarthy. Bobby Kennedy works for Joe McCarthy. Do you realize when Joe McCarthy's, um, he was, was a lawyer for and worked directly with Joe, there was like a Catholic connection between Joe McCarthy and Bobby. Now, Jack stayed a little clear of that. Again, he never falls under anybody political influence and really has no friends in government. The closest friend John F. Kennedy had in the late 40s and 50s, politically speaking, was a forgotten, largely forgotten senator from Florida named George Smathers, because they would go yachting together and, um, and, and you know, flirt with women together and drink and smoke cigars together. Not a lot of substance in their friendship, but that's about it. So he's kind of an island unto himself. But then it all comes together for Kennedy in October of 1957 when the Soviets put Sputnik up in space. That moment of Sputnik is the beginning of Jack Kennedy as a national figure. He had won Congress in 46, was set, thought of as a lightweight. Congress uh, in, um, you know, um, it was 46 he won, 48 he won, 52 he's a senator. He gets reelected in 58. But it's only in 57, only a couple years before he's president, that he la latches on to Sputnik. And he talks about this is proof that we're losing to the Soviets. Sputnik just going around, going beep, 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 you know, with, um, with ham operators and astronomers seeing it and all. Um, some people weren't that afraid about Sputnik. Some people thought, oh, well, we knew Russia does technology. But another group, particularly Democrats, hawkish Democrats, see it as a way to say Eisenhower is weak and ineffective. One of the things that people don't realize when Dwight Eisenhower came in in 1953 is uh, as president, first off, when he ran in 52, we were in the Korean War, and Eisenhower simply said, elect me and I will get you out of the Korean War, or I will solve Korea. I'll go to Korea, is what Eisenhower said. And sure enough, he went to Korea, and by only president in a few months, and we're out of the Korean War. Then Eisenhower is questioning um, why are we spending so much money on military everything? What about schools? What about hospitals? What about infrastructure? And so he has a new look defense policy, it's called, with John Foster Dulles. Um, and it's both hawkish in the sense of telling our adversaries, Ike says, we will do massive retaliation with you if you mess with the United States. On the other hand, Ike turns down missile funding defense contracts. He's not a green light for what he would deride as the industrial military complex. So his balanced budget approach to defense spending, let's say, Eisenhower, gives Kennedy his issue once Sputnik goes up. We're losing. And as I told a previous class here, there, if there's a philosophy to Jack Kennedy, it's win at all cost. Win, win, win. He never lost an election in his life. And it's important to realize he does not know losing. Now, he knows World War II losing, about losing his men. He knows about hurt. He had been sick his entire life from childhood, uh, horrifically um, ill. I told a, a few people the other day, I looked, uh, American Medical Association had me give a speech on illnesses in the president's. And the longest list of person with illnesses was John F. Kennedy, who you might think of as handsome and vigorous, a list this long from childhood onward of every kind of illness you can possibly imagine. The one with the least at that point when I spoke, now Carter has cancer, was Jimmy Carter, who only had hemorrhoids. And it was the only thing on it. Um, the, um, but he was very sick, so he knows adversity. It's his back killed him all the time and all of this. But after Sputnik, by 58, Kennedy picks up on the missile and space gap. That there's the Soviets are beating us in missile technology and beating us in space. And the clamor from Kennedy and others is so great that Eisenhower goes in and creates NASA in 1958. And the big thing to keep in mind about our moon program is peace. 
peaceful space, scientific inquiry. It's the, it's a, it, the world's supposed to be exploring space, not for military purposes, but for peaceful purposes. And the fact that NASA is run by civilians when it was created in 58 and today uh, is quite astounding because look how much missile technology, look at the intersection between NASA and defense spending. But Eisenhower and others said we're going to keep it civilian run. But as I mentioned before, Eisenhower hated the German rocketeers, Werner von Braun, Nazis, in the army now. He never cottoned to him. where Jack Kennedy adopts Werner von Braun. They were together in 1953, voting for Conrad Adenauer as being Times Man of the Year. They became very close personal friends. And so when Kennedy's talking about there's a space gap and a missile gap, down in Huntsville, Alabama, our number one rocket genius who's on TV with Walt Disney all the time is saying, Kennedy's right. We could be, let me fund me and I'll put a satellite like the Soviets have never seen. I'll put a rocket like nobody's ever seen. And Eisenhower basically wanted Von Braun to shut the guy up. Kennedy saw it as an opening of, of, for political purposes that and um, there's a lot of correspondence in my book I found because Kennedy would write notes to college kids on the campaign trail in, in 58 when he was running for senator in 60 where he talks about space and the word he's using in all the letters is the word leapfrog. We've got to leapfrog the Soviets. This, le this uh, lackadaisical Eisenhower um, incremental space program. I want to go way over the Soviets and win. And um, von Braun's saying yes, because Eisenhower chose the Navy to build our rockets, the Vanguard. And they got the winning contracts to do our first satellite launches out of Cape Canaveral, and they blew up. The Navy's Vanguard did not work. And the Air Force was trying different mechanisms where von Braun and the Army was saying, send me, let me. Werner von Braun developed all the Jupiter missiles beyond doing the space rockets. So when you deal with the Cuban Missile Crisis with John F. Kennedy, those are Jupiter uh, missiles we have in Turkey, Von Braun missiles that Kennedy trades. Well, do, if Soviets keep their missiles out of Cuba, ICBMs or, or inter, intermediate range missiles out of Cuba, we will a year later pull our Jupiters out of Turkey. Um, so you can't deal with this Cold War period without the, the, this battle for missiles. And um, in 1960, Kennedy kind of astounds Lyndon Johnson um, by getting the Democratic nomination. Um, no, Kennedy was like a Beto O'Rourke figure. He just started, you know, had the handsome bit, and he grabs onto the new frontier as his slogan. Uh, he doesn't connect himself to FDR. He doesn't connect himself to Truman. Actually, John F. Kennedy is loved by conservatives today. Um, advisors to Trump like Kennedy because he was big on tax cuts. So he is a tax cut President Kennedy who wants to pour $25 billion into going to the moon. And many people thought it'd be $40 billion to go to the moon. That's about $185 billion today's money. Look what, how the trouble Trump's having getting $5 billion for a wall. And you're dealing with a hundred and worth of 185 billion to go to the moon. Um, what Kennedy is good at, guys, is television. There's TV and Kennedy could be the same word. I wrote once a biography of Walter Cronkite, and Walter was didn't have a lot of money when early TV days, 1952 conventions. Cronkite offered for extra cash. He would teach politicians how to look on TV, how to do makeup, how to stare at the camera, make sure you're not sweaty, don't shift down, things that were, you now watch talking heads and they all do it, but when TV was new, nobody knew. Um, Nixon did not take that class, <laughs> but John F. Kennedy took it, and so did Sam Rayburn and others. And Kennedy had grown up with his father, who made Hollywood films, invested heavily in Hollywood, as you know, in Lake Tahoe and all this out here in California. But um, they were, he was in foam hand movies since he was a child being filmed, loved the TV medium. 
And by 1960, when he does get the Democratic nomination, uh, Nixon makes the, the stupid decision of agreeing for four TV debates with John F. Kennedy. Because Nixon's figure, Kennedy, I know him, lightweight. In a, I'll be cream him. I'll get him so twisted up in policy ideas, he won't even know what he's doing. But what Nixon didn't realize that it's you had to be telegenic and project. It's almost a cliche, but it turns to be true. People that listened to the Kennedy Nixon debates on radio thought that um, Nixon won on substance. Anybody watching on TV had to say Jack Kennedy won. Um, but it wasn't just that Kennedy was good at that debates. He one of his key lines in the debates was. Uh, you know, they both acted very gentlemanly, actually, in the debates. If you go back and watch them, um, they behaved well. That, that was the first debates in American history there, that, ever for a presidency. Not the first televised debates. We never had a presidential debate. You know, Lincoln-Douglas debates were about Illinois. It went national. We never had a national presidential debate till 1960 because it didn't go well for Nixon. There were no presidential debates since 1964, none in 1968, none in 72. Only in 76 did Carter and Ford agree to do it, and Jerry Ford made that blunder about Poland and perhaps cost him the presidency. And then since then, it's become a, a bit of a tradition. But in that one debate, Kennedy said, I, um, I, you, you told Khrushchev that we're better at appliances which at, he had met Khrushchev as vice president Nixon and said, we, we have the super appliances, the washing machines. And he was bragging about our everyday kitchen appliances. And Kennedy has the good line and says, I don't want to be first in dishwashers. I want to be number one in rocket thrust. I don't want to see a Soviet flag planted on the moon. I want an American flag planted on the moon, you know, and, uh, and did it well. And he owned that issue. And lo and behold, as you know, Kennedy wins. And he gets a guy, Jerome Wisner, who's the head of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, science advisor, and gets a, tells him quickly, I need a very smart report on what NASA should do under my leadership. Uh, I, I, what, what do I do with NASA? New agency, just created in 58, late 58, only tracking in 59. You need to know what NASA is when it was created it took all of a group um, of assets that we did with military aviation out of Langley, Virginia, uh, Hampton, Virginia, and moved that, those assets into NASA. It took the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here at Caltech Pasadena, moved it into NASA. It took Werner Von Braun's rocket team in Huntsville, Alabama, and moved it out of the Army into NASA. Uh, and there are others. Ames up, up by um, San Francisco comes into NASA, so it's a catch-all. But Eisenhower gets credit for creating this thing. And then he announced we're going to do a Mercury rocket program of, of putting an astronaut into space. But it was debated whether that was smart. Kennedy got a report, and his own science advisor said, forget the whole moon junk, and I don't think we should do manned space. Because, Wisner said, nothing will be worse for American global prestige than dead astronauts floating. You know, here we are. We've been blowing them up on Cape Canaveral not working. What if we get one up? And now that it'll be, the days, every day we'll be picturing our dead astronaut floating around Earth and, uh, or astronauts. It's not worth that much political capital to take that kind of risk. We could do robotic space. We could do monkeys. The Soviets put a dog up, but their dog incinerated up in space, never got them back down alive. But while this report came in, we put a monkey into space, put a chimpanzee into space that was trained from Cameroon, jungles of Cameroon to the deserts of New Mexico to outer space. And then the astronauts hated that because it looks like you could put an ape into space and we don't, we just sit in the capsule, you know. Um, so Kennedy was warned against it, and he was weighing the report right at the time the Bay of Pigs fiasco occurred when we tried, we put Cuban exiles, CIA-backed um, invasion of Cuba. They got thwarted by Castro. It was an Eisenhower CIA plan, but 
Kennedy has egg all over his face for, for it being a real boondoggle that he greenlit it. Well, hard hit for the golden boy who gave that great inaugural speech. And, you know, ask not. Now Bay of Pigs, that's a, a big thumbs down for Kennedy. And then the Soviets send up Yuri Gagarin and they put the first human being, the first person ever into space and beat the United States. And that's on Jack Kennedy's watch. And now the media is saying we're losing. I thought, what happened, Mr. Win the Space Race? You were so big to beat up on Eisenhower. Now they're killing your clock. You know, that's the problem when you, in politics, when you, you use an issue to run on like the wall and then you can't get it done, right? I mean, um, and so Kennedy, after that double whammy, they greenlit Alan Shepard. And Kennedy up till now is keeping two feet away from space. But Alan Shepard of New Hampshire, um, flinty, well-trained military aviator, gets put into space and uh, he comes down. He's barely up. And when he comes back down, he's a big national hero. But what Kennedy saw, not only was he a national hero, we could always use one of those, right? Um, TV ratings were off the charts. Everybody was watching Alan Shepard like numbers nobody's ever seen, like the debate numbers on TV that Kennedy Nixon had. Now Kennedy's got a TV ratings hit with Alan Shepard. And at that point, he sits in the back of a car with Lyndon Johnson, and Lyndon was supposed to be the head of space and Kennedy said, basically, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, if I, I had a plan, Lyndon. If Alan Shepard didn't come back alive, Alan Shepard was in the car with Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and a guy, Newt Minow. And uh, in the back of the car, they, it, it, Kennedy said, Lyndon, if, uh, I was going to blame you if Alan here died. <laughs> Because you're the head of the space committee, so he said I was gonna. You were, you were my scapegoat, and uh, and uh, Newt uh, Minow said, "No, uh, Jack. If if uh, Shepard would have died, you would have put Lyndon up in space next." <laughs> and um, and you know Kennedy, you know, laughed about it. And it but the point was, Jack now grabbed a hold of space. Left, and it's not Lyndon's project. It's no, but it's mine. I own this great space television boom, you know, ratings windfall. And he then decides to give what he calls the second inaugural on, on, on May 25th, 1961, where he goes to Congress and says, we will put a man to the moon by the end of the decade. And sure enough, all of the money comes through. It is a joint bipartisan effort because Jack Kennedy, can't, his secret of why we got to go to the moon is a Kennedy can tell a Democrat, oh, you don't want to beat the Soviets? If you're a conservative Republican and you're an anti-communist, but you don't want to fund Kennedy's big government NASA program, Kennedy's return was, you don't want to beat the Soviet. You want to see, you'd rather see a Soviet flag than an American flag on the moon? No, no, <laughs> I'll back it. And so it pulled together on this security fear of beating the Soviets. But then comes, there are other astronauts, Gus Grissom, we'll talk about right now. But the big one becomes Alan Shepard, when on February 20th, 1962, I mean, it becomes John Glenn, February 20th, 1962, when the Friendship 7 goes into space. Glenn is the Marine from Ohio. Uh, he is, um, Jackie Kennedy said she never met a man that is so self-controlled as, um, as Glenn. She had a giant crush on John Glenn. And she said, Jack's unflappable, but I never met a man as unflappable as Glenn. At all of his tests with NASA, John Glenn's pulse would never go up on these exotic kind of um, stress tests and things. And, uh, and so he was the one we were really putting on, hoping to orbit Earth, which he does three times. And he almost burns in space with Friendship 7. The heat shield's loose. He comes back and lost like five, six pounds on one day, just going up into space from sweating that much. Uh, because the heat, the heat shield got loose and the ca it became like an inferno in that little capsule. But the big drama was for TV, we lost contact with him for like five minutes. And everybody's watching, and now well, the radio stopped. John, you get, John Glenn, do you hear us? You know, <laughs> do you hear us? Silence. 
And as every minute went down, people started thinking that you may, he, he may have perished. And we're watching what was the nightmare that Kennedy's advisor said, dead astronaut. Now you built up this American hero, and now he's going to be his corpse floating around. So when suddenly Glenn's voice got on the radio, at this point, everybody was leaning in, and he's alive, he's alive. And he splashed down into the Atlantic and uh, 40 miles from where they were hoping he would land, so he had to sit in the capsule for a while. And, um, you know, the big thing was not to open that hatch door. Gus Grissom, something happened when Gus Grissom went on a Mercury space and water came in, and nobody knows whether Gus panicked and opened it, and I don't want to get into all that now, but Glenn knew not to, to open that, because they wanted to save the capsule to investigate it, what, what its conditions in space and what had gone wrong and, and all of that. John Glenn becomes a, an extended member of the Kennedy family. Jack gets a hold of him, says, you're, you're no longer an independent, you're a Democrat. They talk about running him for politics, and he does run as a senator eventually from Ohio. Um, he becomes Bobby Kennedy, and John Glenn become like this. He has a free, he lives at Hickory Hill, Bobby Kennedy's house with, the, with this all the time. Ethel Kennedy, who I interviewed for my book, Bobby's Wife, uh, you know, when Robert Kennedy, her husband, was murdered here in Los Angeles, she called John Glenn immediately after the death of her husband and said, get to my home and look after my kids. John Glenn and his wife, Annie, moved in to look after the Kennedy kids. He had become that much part of the family um, for the Kennedys. And, um, and then what Kennedy does very shrewdly is tell Glenn, you're my global ambassador, and that we sent his capsule, Friendship 7, Alan Shepard's was Freedom 7, because of the seven Mercury astronauts. Friendship 7 goes all over the world. Bombay, Mexico City, you know, Santiago, everywhere. And guys, the lines to just look into the little capsule, mile long, four hour waits just to peer into where the spaceman was sat, John Glenn. And Glenn um, goes to the Seattle World's Fair and uh, becomes a grand national hero there. And it's space mania bursting throughout the land. I teach at Rice University, and everything at Houston, Texas is all about Kennedy and space. Kennedy came to Rice on September 12, 1962, and... Um, and get said, why? We choose to the, go to the moon because it's hard. You know, we choose to go to the moon because... And he ties it into the frontier space. The new frontier is, he's always quoting Christopher Columbus as the only European that gets a call out. The rest of it's Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and particularly Lewis and Clark and a core of discovery. And this is the new era of public discovery, space and there's space television programs going on and space architecture. And, um, and um, Houston now becomes a tech hub. And not just that, John F. Kennedy starts recognizing that his new deal, his fair deal, in other words, his pork for people is going to go into the southern zone. He's flooding the southern zone with money to build, pour money into Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri. If you told me what are the key places where government money went into space, in the early 60s, St. Louis, Missouri, Houston, Texas, um, the, at Louisiana, uh, Hancock County, Mississippi, Huntsville, Alabama, um, land, uh, Newport uh, area of um, Tidewater area of Virginia, Cape Canaveral, Central Florida. These were all southern states that were fighting civil rights. And they had the Democratic senators that hated Jack Kennedy's integration, hated the Justice Department civil rights, so Lyndon plays a role now because Kennedy moved all the pork into Houston and into his state, including San Antonio. Lyndon would tell those senators now, hey, look, look to Richard Russell. I'm putting in 150 million into the county. Just about James Meredith. We don't need to criticize the president's civil rights. They were trying to do a dance, Kennedy and Johnson, of winning in 64 on, on, um, on showing that the southern zones, the new technology corridor, California, LA became a big rocket center, the Atlas rocket out here. But the problem that we're seeing today in our culture is there was no NASA tech money put into the Midwest. 
It went all that southern zone. California got a lot. Some up there with big, kind of like the moon capsule was built up in New York. But if you look at the Great Lakes states and all, they didn't share in the bounty of all this federal allocation of money for the first wave of a new technology revolution, which NASA started. NASA started GPS and heart valve devices and anti-icing and the amount, I, in my book, I laundry list the amount of products you'll be stunned that got their first birth out of NASA technology. By the 70s with Silicon Valley, it's a new technology, private sector wave that's coming out here in California and it's hit West Coast, East Coast, the Midwest has missed both technology uh, revolutions of our lifetime. And that's why there's anger in the Midwest. They didn't get part of that, but share part of the new technological age in many ways. At any rate, by um, the time of 1963, Kennedy's toys with the idea of going to the moon with Russia. Uh, but remember, the big events during the Kennedy presidency, the Berlin Wall comes up. That could be... Uh, Kennedy went to Berlin and gave that famous speech there. And whenever he met Khrushchev, the one thing Khrushchev was worried about was our, moon, our going to the moon. Kennedy got into the head of Khrushchev with it. Like, do we really have that technology? Recent files released from KGB and Soviet scientists shows they were trying to go to the moon. The Soviets were trying to go to the moon in the 1960s. The great head of NASA, James Webb, has it exactly right. They really were. There are a lot of conspiracy theories around space. Some people will say there wasn't a space race because the Soviets weren't competing for the moon. They were. The Soviets only stopped trying to go to the moon in 1968 when they had a blow up on their pad uh, and uh, launch pad that killed their top engineers and scientists. As Neil Armstrong, months before Neil Armstrong went, they were sending tortoises to the moon, the Russians. They didn't, weren't going to put a human. They thought they had the technology to release tortoises on the moon. Um, but they were this close. You know, they were, they were, we were racing them in the 1960s. Now, not everybody thought pouring this money into space was good. Dwight Eisenhower called it a stunt. Kennedy's big moon stunt. Um, and, you know, that, that, that we don't want to, why do this race thing? What if you lose? It's not worth it. We, it Eisenhower... I was very sane on this issue. We can't constantly be worried about global prestige and this beating, beating, beating. Um, that doesn't get through to Kennedy. He regularly visits Cape Canaveral, Jack Kennedy, um, regularly. Regularly goes to Huntsville to meet with Werner von Braun. He becomes a bit of a space geek. Not the technical aspects, but he started reading everything about it and recognizing his legacy was tied to it. By 1963, Dallas, when he's killed, he was going on a space tour the days before his death in Dallas. Um, and he had been with Werner von Braun. Um, he then went into San Antonio and gave a brilliant speech when he talks about an Irish writer who there's a wall and they took it. And he said, that, and then you take the little boys, throw their favorite cap over the wall. And now they have no choice but to find a way to climb the wall to go get their hat, you know. That's what we're doing in space. We have thrown our hat over the wall, you know. Just great language. We're Ted Sorensen written stuff. But uh, um, there he's with the astronaut Gordon Cooper. And Gordon Cooper was the last of the Mercury astronauts. Because Mercury's one astronaut, Gemini is two, Apollo is the three. And um, Kennedy's the one who's pouring the money into Gemini as the as stepping stone to Apollo. And um, he tells Gordon Cooper to come with him to um, Dallas to have a space hero in the open convertible there with him. Um, and Gordon Cooper, last minute, was called that he could not go there. Um, and Kennedy rode on the convertible without Gordon Cooper waving with him. And... Um, and, of course, when he got killed, he was minutes away from giving an incredible speech about going to the moon and the space program. That's what he was going to speak at the trademark to when he was assassinated. Um, of course, he, his, uh, that moment when Kennedy was killed, we all remember uh, Walter Cronkite looking at the glass and, you know, clock time stopped. 
But then that weekend, like, who killed Kennedy? Who is Lee Harvey Oswald? Who is, you know, where's Kennedy's body? Is it going to be Barry? Why is Jackie Kennedy still wearing a pink Chanel suit with blood all over it? You know, did the Russians do it? Did the Cubans do it? I mean, it was a lot, and everybody watched. Everybody will say, I remember older generation will say, I remember the Kennedy assassination. They remember watching Walter Cronkite talk about it uh, because TV had become that ubiquitous. And Cronkite was like a rabbi or a a grief counselor or something that weekend, in in addition to being a broadcaster and a journalist. Um, But Kennedy, as you know, is buried in um, there. The big thing Jackie Kennedy does As soon as she got out of her pink suit, as soon as they're back in Washington, her first meeting with the new president, Lyndon Johnson, she goes and sees Lyndon and Lady Bird and says to both of them, I I have a request as the widow. I I want Jack's moon program, Apollo, to continue. I want that to be his legacy. Lyndon and Lady Bird said, yeah, you have it. The first honor of John F. Kennedy after his death is Johnson signing the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, named after John F. Kennedy. Um, And Lady Bird takes takes a, I mean, uh, Jackie takes a deep interest in the program. Werner von Braun, the great rocket scientist who's building these rockets, he was supposed to have dinner with Jack and Jackie three days before Kennedy was killed. He was going to the White House to have a private dinner with the Kennedys. He's there in Huntsville and decides to work overtime, we're going to get to the moon, and we're going to fulfill Kennedy's pledge by the end of the, end of the decade. Um, Jan- January 29th, um, 1964, not me- weeks really after Kennedy's death, Von Braun puts his first Saturn rocket into space, and he writes Jackie, I waited, to, here it is, and he tells her about it and says, uh, this is, I, I put your husband's initials on the, on the rocket, JFK, and uh, and a very nice, moving condolence letter to her. But don't you? But you better understand. You know, we're we're. I'm not giving up. And she writes him back in a handwriting, which I found um, a, a very moving letter, where she's saying, uh, "Whatever you do, I the one fear I have that people will forget going to the moon. That be without Jack's leadership, the country won't do it. Please, whenever you can, mention my husband's name." mention Jack's love of space, mention his, his determination, keep that flame alive um, in, in this very um, moving letter. And of course, Lyndon Johnson, with all he has to do in the 60s, right? The Great Society programs, Medicaid, Medicare, you know all this, Vietnam War, we kept funding going to the moon. So a lot of senators didn't want to. Barry Goldwater wanted it killed on the right. Um, Senator Proxmire of Wisconsin wanted it killed. Um, a lot of civil rights activists wanted it killed. Like, why aren't we putting money into urban poverty? Why are we doing this moon pledge? Kennedy's death may, may have fueled the continued funding of it. It became seen as going to the moon as Kennedy's legacy. Alas, um, when Apollo 1 disaster happened, our first Apollo, when our three astronauts blew up on the pad, James Webb got left NASA. Webb was Kennedy's head of NASA. He was a North Carolinian and a genius managerial budget mover of monies. Genius man, James Webb, un- a technocrat. Um, doesn't get the press he should get. But um, Johnson continues the program, and by the time Nixon comes in in early 69, it's all queued up. We're ready to go to the moon that summer, and you get that extraordinary um, a scenario of we're actually finally doing it. The whole world watching a half a billion people watched 50 years ago this summer, half a billion um, around the world on TVs uh, when we picked the right astronauts and Neil Armstrong landed there. Uh, he carried with him Armstrong a piece of the Wright brothers plane as a souvenir on him. Um, and when they went down in NASA, all the engineers both at Cape Canaveral and in Houston you know, anything could go wrong. Just because Armstrong says that's one giant step for man and, you know, they take photo of the American flag and all, that's one part of the mission completed. But if they don't bring them back alive, it's, it, it, you know, it's a problem. So you can't really re- have relief until they brought the astronauts on board. And the second the astronauts were recovered uh, on both the board, giant board up on at NASA in Houston and in Cape Canaveral, it put Kennedy's 
May 25th, 1961. We're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. And then it said, task accomplished. And um, at that point, um, Nixon did not want to mention Kennedy. Um, uh, Pat Moynihan and Bill Moyers pleaded with Kennedy or Nixon to call that Saturn V or the Eagle the John F. Kennedy. And, and Nixon and Haldeman said, I, enough Kennedy. I'm not, we're not calling it. It's, you know, I, I'm president. It's my moon rocket. I'm not giving the Democrats the credit. Um, but he, when uh, the most moving thing I found was at the next, that day when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and they passed mission, put task accomplished, mission accomplished um, on Kennedy's grave at Arlington Cemetery, which was very near Gus Grissom, the astronaut who, who got blown up, and James Webb, the Marine and head of NASA's buried near Kennedy's grave too. There was just a simple card that somebody wrote that said, um, Mr. President, the Eagle has landed with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you. <laughs>